Thankful for those songs. Miss Connie, would you stand, please? There's the love of my life since I was 12 years old. And, uh, we, we didn't marry at 12. Her daddy wouldn't let us. But we did marry some years later, and what a blessing she's been. May I say I'm thankful for Brother Danny and Brother Jimmy for this count meeting. And Brother Jimmy, you said everything I think I told you to say about me. I appreciate that. No, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And I'm grateful to God for what He's allowed us to be a part of the work of God. To let us be here. I, I thought of what Paul said over in 1 Thessalonians. Where he said, I, I would have come to you again, but, but Satan hath hindered us. And they are hindrances in this life. But I'm glad for the God who gives us victory. Just stay with the course. Amen. You have your Bibles today, 1 Samuel 14, 1 Samuel chapter 14, my, my, did we hear preaching this morning, it was so wonderful what the Word of God will do, you know these men of God got up here and expounded the scriptures and it's life, I can't explain it, I don't want to say it's mystic, but there's they, life in the Word of God, it'll do something for you, amen, I mean i I understand more and more why when the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. I mean, because along the word pounded into your soul, it just keeps changing you to be more in the image of Jesus. Amen. Matter of fact, I've been out sacrificing this evening. Amen. I took my wife, those other ladies, to Walmart. Amen. I sat out in the bus. I said, God, I'm sacrificing. You hear me? Amen. You men know what I'm talking about, don't you? Last time I went shopping with my wife down at the mall, I said, baby, we got three choices. We can divorce. You can kill me or I can kill you or I'm going to commit suicide. <laughs> Amen. No, it's a wonderful thing to get to go with your wife. Praise the Lord for it. And I'm going to tell you, ever, ever, I just say amen to the truth preached here, every bit of it. I wish, I wish those sermons was preached all over America. Amen. First Samuel chapter 14 this evening. I'll just begin reading in verse 6, and then we'll come back if you'd like to stand with us for a moment. and Read down through verse 14, and then over to verse 23. Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go with the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to say by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, Come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes, for they hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And the first slaughter which Jonathan his armor bearer made was about 20 men. Look over to verse 23. So the Lord saved Israel that day. So the Lord saved Israel. I, I thought of a couple of titles. I, I wanted to title it, The Day the Lord Saved the Saved. The Day the Lord Saved the Saved. But you may want to end up titling it, One Man and a Sword. Or maybe I should say, One Man and the Sword. Father in heaven, as we come to your throne of grace this evening, many have already prayed for us, and I'm so grateful. God, I admit to you that I am nothing, and based on your own word, I can do nothing. This warfare that we in, this preaching, these blessings, are spiritual. And God, except the Holy Ghost of God, breathe upon us in this place. We shall walk out unchanged and untouched. But, oh, God, should you choose to speak here today, 
God, you could transform some man to be a Jonathan or Jesus. God, we realize the church is in a condition that she needs to be saved from where she's at. Help us, O God, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If I could paint just a picture of a moment where we're at. Saul is the king of Israel. Saul has already got in sin trouble with God. Boy, when the preacher gets in sin trouble, I'm going to tell you many people suffer because of it. Over and over in my life, I saw men of God get in trouble, sin trouble. I want you to understand it is not you and God. It is you and everyone else and all eternity. Saul had got into sin, got away from God. Saul went down and took on the ephod to be a priest. He had no business stepping in the place that God had not ordained him to be. And may I say, you and I today, anytime we step in a place God has not ordained us to be, we are in direct disobedience and rebellion against God. God didn't make me a woman. I should never try to be one. Amen. I want you to understand if you're in the church and you're not the pastor of the church, you are in direct rebellion and disobedience to God if you try to be the pastor. We need to learn just to be who God wants us to be and where God wants us to be. And if God's placed us there, then it's by His grace and mercy He's placed us there. Saul got in trouble, and, and, and Jonathan saw this. Once Saul got in trouble, then here's what happens. The armies of God began to scatter. Once we get in sin, it, it affects people around us. They lose something. You have lost all respect for the leaders of America. I'm sorry to say that, but you have. Most of the people in the world has lost respect for the men of God. I'm saddened to say that, but it's the truth. And here we are in the history of Israel, and now this, this 10,000-man army that Saul just had a few days prior to this is now down to a few hundred men. Not only are they not willing to go to battle against the Philistines, they are now in hiding. And Jonathan looks it over. Let me tell you where, what happened to them. When the Philistines had come in before Saul's day, they, was, they were wise. The enemy's wise. you believe that? The Bible said, be as wise as a serpent. The enemy's wise. You know what he took out of Israel? He, he, he took all the sword makers. He took the men out of Israel that could make swords and sharpen them and carry them down to his land. And so if Israel wanted the sword, they had to go down to the world. You know what God? You know what God, I suppose, has allowed? Or we've allowed? We've allowed the enemy to come in and take the sword away from us. Now don't, don't say he hadn't, he has. Most of us have a Bible, but we don't know the Bible. I want you to understand, for me not to know this Bible, it'd be just the same if I never held one in my hand. Maybe I am under greater condemnation. If I understand this text, there's two swords in Israel. Saul's got one, Jonathan's got one. And I want you to understand without the sword, without the sword, I'm talking about the word of the living God. I, I don't make any apologies where I stand. To me, this, I want you, this is the word of God. We, we don't vote on it at our church. It's the word of God. If you don't like it, find somebody that don't believe the word of God. Amen. I come to preach. I'm not going to get up here and preach and apologize for what the word of God says. The Bible says there's hell, there's hell. If the Bible says adultery is adultery and it's sin, adultery is sin. Amen. But you know what we've done? We, we've let the enemy take the sword away from us. Oh, they steal one or two and thank God they are. Hallelujah. I'm glad there's a few left with a sword. I want you to know that when Jonathan looks around, you know what he sees? He sees one man, his daddy who has a sword, he's in hiding. He's got about 600 soldiers with him hid out from the enemy. He looks around and there's a multitude of the enemy. So many of them, they divide up in about three groups and go different ways and says, boy, we're going we're gonna to get this bunch here, these Jews now. I want you to know the devil is after us like he's never been after us in my generation or my lifespan. I remember when America had moral Christianity. I don't know if they were born again, but they had moral Christianity. We living in a day that if you are a moral Christian, then the world looks at you as a moron. 
We're living in a day to day. I read an article in Times Picayune paper not recently, just recently, where an editorial from the Washington Post wrote, and the problem is not with the Muslims. Shaquille O'Neal's a Muslim, it said. And he named several ball players. They good people. That's not the problem. You people got a problem voting with a, for Obama because he's got a Muslim background? He said that wasn't the problem. He said the problem in America was fundamental Christians. That's where your problem's at. I read this article and I thought, my goodness, I've never blown up anybody. A few I might have thought about, but I've never blown up anybody. I, I've never tried to destroy and damage a world and a society, but yet you and I are to blame. I want you to understand the world is saying that. The television's saying it. The newspaper's saying it. It's all our fault. Now, every how you look at it today, if you turn to chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says this of Israel, Now it came to pass upon a day. We're in a day. A day, whether it's 24-hour period, or whether he's talking about a day, a period of time, may I say it's a dark day. It's a dark day in Israel. I mean, here's the people of God. This is the people they're talking about Exodus this morning. This is the God, the people of God that Brother Sonny just preached about. The I Am. Glory to God. I mean, the mighty God who got in a burning bush, who got the burning out of the bush into the man and sent him down to Egypt and transformed a world and defeated Pharaoh's army. This is the same God. But you know, in America, it's a dark day. Paul said, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And we in this period, seems like, when we've not treasured the Word of God, we've not taken this sword and made it the intimate part of our life. If I want God to speak to me today, I, don't, I want you to know it's going to be through this book. I'm not saying the Holy Ghost don't talk to us, because the Bible says that the, that the church is here what the Spirit has to say. But I want you to understand, I don't have to run all over the world to find out what God's got to say. I can get in the book. Amen. This sword is how I defend myself and my family. This sword is the offensive weapon that will buddy, that we can run the enemy down and defeat him. And we get away from the Word of God, we get away from God. You cannot separate His Word and Himself. In the beginning was the Word. You know where this Bible was in the beginning? It was in heaven. And God breathed upon men, holy men of old, and brought us this book. But we in a day where we've let the world, maybe, maybe our time management, maybe we've let entertainment, we've let everything come along and steal the Word of God away. The Bible illustrates it as seed that's sown in hearts. Some hearts are hard. Some, some soil is real shallow. But only... If I understand the Bible, what Jesus is saying, only at the most 25% has soul that the Word of God can get in and produce fruit. Jonathan looked around and he said, uh, Boy, it's a dark day. The swords are going out of Israel. Two men had a sword. I, I say this, the sword's gone today. Paul said, preach the Word. Now, now let me tell you, I don't know how it is where you at. But preaching ought to be the preeminent thing of the church. Not drama. Not music. Not fellowship. I want you to know the number one priority of the church ought to be the preaching of the Word of God. The Bible says preach the Word. The Bible says it's by the foolishness of preaching God chose to save them that would believe. It's not a matter of what I think about the Word of God. If I believe the Bible, the, the Bible teaches me to put preeminence on the Word. You know, somebody comes along and says, Well, preacher, I think we're having too much preaching. I want you to understand, all that is, is the devil trying to take the sword out of the pulpit. And he has. The tragedy of the church of America is that we've allowed the enemy to take the sword away. Now we may go through a prayer book or we may have some principles or we're going to go through this lesson or that lesson. But I want you to understand, you cannot substitute something of rubber with something of steel. And the Word of God is what men, women, boys and girls need to pierce their heart. My grandchildren used to have these little rubber knives. 
and they'd come up and stick me. And I'd play like, boy, it really hurt. I, I want you to understand it never hurt me. People don't want something that'll hurt them. So what we said, we said, let's just soften the word. Let's soften it up. Let's don't tell men they sinners on the road to hell. And so what we've done, we've taken away the word. You take the sword away and the enemy's got heyday. But I say the sword's been taken from the pulpit, from the home, from the government, taken out of education, and you and I cannot win the battle without the sword of God. The second thing that I would say is I'm glad one man had a sword. Now you listen to me. There was one man in Israel who had a sword. And you know what happened to this one man who had a sword? What you hold in your hand today? They began to be some divine impulses come across his heart. He, he couldn't explain it, but he held in his hand a sword. And somehow or another, the sweet Holy Ghost of God began to breathe down on his soul. And he began to feel something in his soul, a stirring that he had never felt. And boy, I'll tell you what, the Spirit of God and the Word of God can do a work in this world. I don't care what the odds are. I'll tell you, one can chase a thousand when God's Holy Ghost and God's Holy Word gets in it. And boy, I'll tell you what, God... Begin to beat in this boy's heart. When these divine impulses begin to come to Jonathan's heart, he looked at that sword and he said, I've got what it takes to win. Men of God, God asked Moses, what you got in your hand? Moses says, I can't go, I can't do it. He said, what's that in your hand? God has already equipped us with what we need for victory. You can quit looking. I tell you, we got it. We hold it in our hand. This is the authority of God. This is Him speaking. And here, this young Jonathan began to have this divine impulse. You ever get those? Boy, you just want to preach hell hot, heaven sweet. Those divine impulses when you're reading the Scripture and something stands out to you and you say, Boy, that's what I want to use. You go here preaching like we've heard this morning. And boy, you sit there and you begin to take notes and it begins to say something to you. I want you to know the Word of God is quick and powerful. I want you to know it's a living Word. It's alive. And buddy, it's supposed to beat in our hearts and become the passion of our soul so that it's not just us teaching a lesson. It's us breathing out the Word of the living God. And this began to happen to this boy. Chapter 14, verse 1 says that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man, who bore his armor, come and let us go over to the Philistine garrison. He told not his father. Isn't that a shame? I, I won't preach on that, but I, I'll tell you, that's a disgrace to a daddy. But, but here, here he says, I, I want to do something. Any of y'all ever want to do something for God? I mean, you, don't, you can't explain it. I sat with a boy yesterday, man, 40-something years old. And I said, I listened and he began to tell how that he can't teach Sunday school without wanting to preach. He can't bring a devotion in church without wanting to preach. And he said, boy, I, I just tell you what, I don't know what to do, preacher. I said, what do you mean you don't know what to do? He said, well, boy, I, I go to my church and I, I, I don't have a pastor and they call on me to pray and I just want to call heaven down. And they bring, call on me to bring a devotion and I get up there and get to preaching and... and and I don't know what to do. I said, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Is it you don't know, you don't want to know what to do? You're trying to get out of doing it? Or what's holding you back? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I mean, you're telling me. What is God telling you to do? He's telling me to preach. I said, what's wrong with preaching? Hello? A lot of us just trying to hold back what God already, we know God wants us to do. I'm glad Jonathan wasn't that way. Once the sweet Holy Ghost of God began to give him this spiritual impulse in his soul, he said, boy, I'm going to do something. Called his armor bearer and said, let's go. Now, that doesn't sound like much. His daddy and his daddy's army is hid back up in the hills. Who, who are you waiting on? Some of us are always waiting on somebody else to do something for God. We, we say, boy, if, there's more of us. We can win. Here's a guy that took one sword and won. Hello? 
I want you to understand it's not what others do, it's what you do. Some of you sit here and say, I'm too old. Who told you you was too old? I mean, who told you that? You say, well, I, I can't do anything for God. Who told you you couldn't? Where's it say in the Bible? You, you're too old to do anything for God. Now, you, you're not what you once was, but that's probably a blessing. Maybe you're in a condition to do more for God than you've ever been. Amen? Because the power is of God. When, when Jonathan, these divine impulses on this dark day, began to beat in his soul, he saw his daddy in Israel hiding. He looked at the armies of the Philistines and they dividing up. They said, many of them go in three different directions, going to conquer Israel. He said, I can't take it anymore. I would to God we'd get to the point we couldn't take it anymore. We'd have to crawl down to the altar of God and do what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. I would to God that you could say, I'm going back home to my church and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm tired of going through the rituals of the same old, same old. I want something in my soul. I want something in my preacher. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the Word of God and I'm going to do what the Scripture says. I'm going to get a hold of God. And I want to see the sweet Holy Ghost breathe down upon our church service. I want life to come in it. I want to defeat the devil. I want to have victory in my life. And, and you can do that. Are there difficulties? If you look at verse 4, you'll find there's difficulties. Not only was it a dark day in Israel, but there was a divine panting in his soul. Once God wants you to do something, here's what you're going to discover. It's going to be difficult, if not impossible. In this case, it was impossible. I, I like it when somebody like Caleb says, give me this mountain. You know, there's always a bucket brigade around church. You know what I mean by the bucket brigade? They run up with buckets of water and pour it on somebody that gets on fire. You can't do that. We've never done it that way. You can't do that. Nobody's ever heard of such. I want you to understand, the Scripture says, is anything too hard for God? Is it? Is it too hard for a hundred-year-old man to father a child? Must not be. He kept in business for a while. I mean, is it too hard for God to open up a sea and blow back the sea and the dry ground and then walk through? Is that too hard for God? Is it too hard for God to raise a man that's been in the grave four days and by now he stinketh? Is that too hard for God? I want you to understand, we limit the Holy One of Israel by telling God, I can't do this, we can't do that, our church can't do it. Now, I'm not talking about going down to the bank and borrowing a million dollars to do something for God. I'm talking about getting yourself in a condition where God can do it through you. Now, they were difficulties. So I understand it. There was two ranges of cliffs between him and the enemy. Now, if you can get this picture... When Jonathan tells his armor bearer, let's don't tell nobody, let's go see. I got a sword. My daddy's up here hiding. He's got a sword. Only two swords in the army. But let's you and I go see what's going on. And they went through these, well, one of them's name says it's a thorn bush, and the other one says it's a cliff. If you look it up, it's two ranges of rocky cliffs with thorns and thistles. That doesn't sound inviting to me at all. And they crawl through this. I, I mean... Now, you've got to get this picture. They out here, the Bible says, on their hands and knees crawling. Now, what I see in this spiritually is that they had the sword. You know what the sword is? Somebody hold up the sword. Now, that's a sword. That's right. Now, here they are. They're crawling. What do you picture when you see a man crawling with a sword? i tell you what I picture. I see some man who has humbled himself under the mighty hand of God. And he's laid his Bible open. And he's beginning to glean from it the promises of God. And then outside of himself recognizing, I can't do this. So he bows down before God. And he says, God, there's enemies here. And, and they run in our land. They, 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 they taken away our families. And there's no power. We have no weapons. We have nothing. But I've got a sword. And he, he began to face the difficulties on his knees. I want you to understand, man of God, you take your Bible and you get on your knees before the God of glory and you keep crawling. The Bible said, He who humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jonathan crawled his way through. If you pastored many times, you're going to find you're going to crawl your way through. You're going to crawl, you're going to cry. But I want you to know 
over the next cliff. There's victory. There's victory. I'd love to see every man of God, every church of God have victory. I'm so tired of the world looking at us. I heard one of you men say here several years ago, I don't know if it was Ron Dunn or someone else, never left me. But they said this, you know why people won't come to church anymore? Because they've been. Now, now what an indictment against us. Why should I go up there? You people are no different than us. We come in with no joy of the Lord, no power of God, no transforming preaching. I want you to understand, God is a God of life, not death. I mean, we don't want to get, we don't want to get too carried away with God. Because, you know, the charismatic, that crowd over there, whatever. I want you to understand. I don't care if you swing from the rafter if you know God. Huh? Well, that'll make you mad. He had to overcome difficulties. One sword, one man, mountains of difficulties. One sword, one man, an army of enemies. But he persevered. What's your excuse? Why are you quit? Why are you throwing in the towel? I wonder sometimes how many of us would make it if we just wouldn't quit. I called Brother Jimmy up years ago and told him, and this is his counsel. I can almost quote him verbatim. And I said, Brother Jimmy, I think I'm fixing to resign. I'm tired. I'm going to give it up. You know what his counsel was? No, you not, boy. Suck it up and keep going. I took his word, sucked it up, and I'm still going. I'm glad I'm still going. I want you to understand. I feel confident he prayed for me. But you listen. The victories that I would have missed if I had not kept going. Yes, I had to crawl. And yes, I will crawl again. And yes, I wake up every day of my life a beggar unashamedly before God. I try to tell myself and God every day, it's me, the beggar, Lynn Martin. I'd rather be the beggar and end up where the beggar Lazarus. I'm not talking about works for salvation, but I'm talking about in the presence of the Holy One. Then to get up and claim I'm rich and end up like Lazarus or the, I mean the rich man or the Laodicean church. But anyway, he, here, here he is. It's a dark day. He has these divine impulses. And then he begins to face the difficulties. And he says, I, I'm going to go on. I'm going to persevere. Then the next thing that I would say is that this man had a proper view of God. Boy, I, I like it when people preach on God. This, this boy had a proper view of God. Now, I don't know if he knew all about God, but look what he says down in verse 6. He said, let us go over into the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Kind of like, sounds like to me, about like the view of the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. As they faced this furnace, they told Nebuchadnezzar, said, we're not going to bow down to your false god. He says, well, I'm going to burn you up. I'm just going to, I'm going to put you in the fire and I'm going to fry you whole. You know what they told him? That's what God wants, do it. But if it's not what God wants, you can't do it. Hello? Made, made him so mad, he said, heat the furnace seven times. Now, I don't think they had some meter that said it seven times. Huh? I believe the thing was, he said, get it as hot as you can get it. And with, with urgency, they did, and they got it so hot that the strong men who cast them in burned up. But he bowed down and looked in that furnace. You know what he saw? You can see the same thing in your life. When you get to the point that you're sick of compromising with the devil, you sick of putting everything in the world before the Word of God? Turn the television off? Leave the paper in the mailbox? Leave the food in the cabinet? I will not have anything before I'll take on the Word of God. The Word of God's not got to just become a rule of your life. It's got to become your life. Jonathan said the only thing that we got that will save us is a sword. And he took this sword and he began to crawl. And he began to make it. And he says, listen, here's the way God is. God can do it, for there's no restraint to the Lord to say by many or by few. Look up the word restraint. It means hindrances. You know what he's saying? He says God can take one man and one sword and whip the enemies. 
Thank God there have been some men who walked across the pages of history that's made a difference in millions of lives. And I believe the same God who did it in Billy Sunday's day, Billy Graham's day, or Billy Gizzard's day can still do it today in your life. He's no different. He's just waiting for somebody to get a hold of the Word of God. Quit apologizing. Preach it. Quit, quit questioning it. Believe it. But Professor so-and-so, he, he told me that wasn't true. That part of the Bible wasn't true. Well, go down there and believe him. Be a wimp. Go down there and believe him. Be powerless. Go down there and believe him and stay in bondage to the enemy. I either get before God and say, I don't care what Professor so-and-so says. God is God. Now listen. You know what stops people with God? When I, when I look at the Scriptures, I, I'm amazed at the many sins David committed long before he ever met Bathsheba. But God still used him. You know why? Because he believed God. You, you know what stops us? When Jesus, when Jesus in Mark 1 goes down to, to Nazareth, the Bible makes this statement. He could not do many mighty works there. His own hometown? I mean, it looks like to me that's where he wanted to really work. He did really want to work there. He wanted to do a great work there. But he didn't do a great work there. Why isn't God doing a great work in my life? Now listen to me, I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the sword. The, the reason God cannot do great work, he says in verse 6 of that text, is it because of their unbelief. I can't take this Bible and question God. But Lynn, you understand all the Bible? <laughs> oh, man. I don't understand how a stale phone works. Now, don't look at me like that. You don't either. I never have figured out. I've sat there and punched a button on a microwave and watched water boil. I said, how does it do that? You know, they, they so many things that I don't know. I, I don't know how babies formed in the mother's womb. I, I, I don't understand how it is when a man gets up with the power of God on him and he preaches and God does something in somebody's heart out there. I don't understand it. But I'm telling you it works for the glory of God. Lord, to quit questioning God and start believing God. Did, 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 did the great fish really swallow Jonah? Why would you question it? It's in the Bible, isn't it? I, I, I mean, did Jesus really perform these miracles? Did he really raise Lazarus from the dead? And, and we ought to stop questioning what God can do and say, God, if you're the God of the Bible, I want to be like Gideon. Where are the miracles of our fathers? God, if you've been filled and, and, and you took men of all and anointed them with preaching power, then I want to be the man. I want the sword in my hand in my heart and I want you to breathe on my life. This old boy had a desire. Well, when God blew up on his heart, he was ready. He wanted to do something for God. The next thing that I see in this text is not only did he have a proper view of God. The Scripture says unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You ever read that in Ephesians 3? Now listen to what he says. According to the power that worketh in us. Let that sink in. According to the power that worketh in us. Now, I want you to know God's not bound. But if God's going to do a work, He's going to do it through you. you. You know where God's hands are at in the world today? Hold them up. There's, there's God's hands. You know, where, you know where God's pocketbook is? Right here. You know where God's feet is? Hey, right here. The Bible says we're laborers together with God. He, he's the vine, we're the branches. He says, you sucking off of me, you bring forth the fruit. If the work of God's going to be done, God's going to use somebody to do it. Why not you? Why not you? Can you give me some reason why he shouldn't? You say, oh, oh I'm like Moses, I can't speak. Give you a chance and God gets on you. They got down to Egypt, God got on Moses and they couldn't shut him up. Is that not true? What about on the day of Pentecost? Was it not ignorant and unlearned men? You say, I'm not educated enough. Who told you you had to be educated to be used of God? 
I'm not against education, but I'm telling you this, it's not education. There's a lot of educated fools. There's a lot of men who have degrees hanging all over the wall who do not know God. And Paul said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. I don't know what it is to have the resurrected power of God flowing through my soul. You ever want that? Now listen. Here we go. He says this. He had a dream. Look what he tells his arm bearer. <laughs> he said, And his arm bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Now, I wish I could some way expound upon this passage. I can't. It's beyond me. Some of you other guys have to do it. But he had a dream. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. You know what many of us see? We see the ministry as a means not to have to work. Well, I don't have to have a real job. We see the ministry as a means to go to camp meetings and enjoy the fellowship of others. I, I, I'm, I'm against work as much as the next guy. But there's a labor. You, you, you start praying, that's a labor. Much study is a weariness to the flesh. You know, that word of God will wear you out. Praying will wear you out. Pastor in the church will uh, uh, beat you up. It'll wear your knees out, your mind out. If you do what God wants you to do, God didn't set you up as a trophy. God saved you to be a servant. And, and if you're going to serve the church of the living God and the people of God in any capacity, then you ought to be willing to say with the Paul, I am willing to spend and be spent for the cause of Christ. This is not a vacation. If I understand Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to rest one day. There's a present rest in Jesus. I'm not working to get saved. I'm saved by grace through faith. I've been washed in the blood of God. I'm as saved as I'm ever going to be. I'm just trying to catch up with me who's already in heaven. I am seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, and I'm just running this race to get to the finish line. I'm already there. Done deal. Signed, sealed, and delivered. But while I'm here, I am to labor. Labor is a curse. This boy, I, I can see Jonathan and his armor bearers, they go across these cliffs and these thorny bushes. They're bleeding from head to toe already. And, and they get to where the enemy's at. And they said, now, the fight's fixing to take place. And the armor bearer said, do all that's in your heart. What is in your heart? I ask you, what is in your heart to do for the glory of God? You say, I don't have anything in my heart. Then you ought to run to God and say, God, give me a dream. Give me a vision. You know how Milldale Baptist Church and this campground's built? You want me to tell you how it was built? Raise your hand, Brother Jimmy. He had a dream. God had given in his heart. He pastored a little church. No, no, no. Listen, I'm not saying this to be negative to anyone that didn't want to follow the dream God had put in his heart. Without any ill feelings, he left that church and come down here and started Milldale. You know why? Because he could see you sitting here one day down the road. He could see the kitchen over there. He could see the barracks back here when there wasn't one thing here. Brother Harold Brown, many of you know him, how he started Fairhaven's Children's Home. Dollar and fifty cents. Ball of twine, some steaks. But you know what he had? He had a dream. He had something in his soul that God had put there. And you ought to have something in your soul. I'm not going to be the normal preacher. I'm going to be the one who supernatural God gets up on and uses me for the glory of God. You ought to have something from God. You say, God hadn't done it yet. Who said it was over? God might just be waiting for you to get in line with Him. He could use you. I mean, this boy says, i got a dream. Oh, I could talk about it as hard I won't do to time. But you listen at me. He had a passion for God. And he also had the power of God, the purpose of God. It wasn't for himself, it was for the glory of God. The Bible says not only did he have a dream, and this armor bearer said, do all that's in your heart. I wonder if God told every one of us here, said, okay, Lynn, go do all that's in your heart. What would I go do? What would you do for God if you just did what was in your heart today? You say, Brother Lynn, it's in my heart to give Milldale Church and Camp $20,000. Is that really in your heart? Is it? 
Don't go borrow the money. Just begin to give what you can give and see what God does for you. You, you, you say it's in my heart to start a children's home, is it? Start taking in one off the street. Is that way Papa started? Just take in one. Then when you get 25 in there, then you'll start hunting a ball of string and a dollar and a half. I, I, I mean, you know, we, we want it all now. You know what this present generation wants? I see it all the time. Some kid walks down here and says he loves her, and he don't even know what love is. She walks down the other aisle over here and says, I love him. She don't know what love is. They get married and go out and say, let's go buy us a $300,000 house, new sports car, boat, motor, guns, everything else. And they sink their sales in debt that they could never possibly even learn what love is. But they've got to have it all right now, and they're willing to do it in some payment plan. You, you know what we need, folk? We need somebody who's willing to crawl down on their hands and knees, take this old Bible and say, God, I don't have anything. I'm as broke as Moses. I'm like Gideon of old, God. I'm the least in my father's house. There's no way on the sun, God, I can give you anything. But God, there's a way you could give me you. If you give me you, I can do anything you will for me to do. He had a dream. The next thing, if you read the text, an interesting statement. He discovered himself to the enemy. I like that. You know what he said? He said, we're going to make ourselves known to the enemy. And if the enemy says we're coming over there, we're in trouble. But if the enemy says for us to come to them, we got them. Amen? You know what we ought to do? We ought to discover ourselves to the enemy. We ought to let them know who we are and what we are. We try to hide sometimes when we get around other people. The world, the Bible said to be a friend of the world is to be at enmity with God. You don't have to hide God from the world. Jesus said, I want your light to shine. Matter of fact, he so illustrated it. He said that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. I mean, we already want people to see. I, I, I see this generation coming up and said, hey, let's look like hell, talk like hell, dress like hell, speak like hell, so we can win people to Jesus. That's out of hell. I want you to understand, God wants somebody who's willing to stand up with God on him and God in him and with a Bible and says, Thus saith the Lord, here's the way, walk ye there in it. He, he let the enemy know he was on, I'm here. We're right here. I can just see them. Once the enemy found out they was there, 10,000 of them grouped up in different groups. Jonathan punches his arm bare and he said, I'm going to go in and hit him with a sword. You come by and stab him with a spear. We'll get him. You know, we ought to yoke up with people that want God. Oh, Jonathan come out off his knees with a sword in his hand. And he who had a dream of victory began to swing that sword, buddy. This one would fall, and when he fell, that arm bearer would stab him. Bow. Killed 25 men in what did he say, a half acre of ground? Now they're fighting with everything they got, folks. You think you've been in a fight? You think because you had trouble with a deacon or a teacher or a lady in the church, you've been in a fight? These boys fighting. They're not fighting for their life, they're fighting for God. There's a vast difference. They wasn't fighting to, for, to survive. They wasn't fighting for their job. They fighting for the glory of God. There is a difference. And because they fighting for the glory of God, they fought on, they fought on. And they fought, I mean, a half an acre of land. And, and 25 men have died laying there dead. And you know what happens? Then God gets in the battle. But when God gets in on it, hello, he turned this group of enemies against this group of enemies. So the enemies who's supposed to have been friends are killing one another. Can God do that? All through the Bible we see it. And step by step. You, you know what happened to all them old boys in hiding? Once they saw there was a man down there with a sword that would use it, they began to come out of hiding. They said, man, that looks good. Let's get on it. This iron sharpeneth iron. Does it? Somebody gets fired up for God, somebody else will get fired up for God. After a while, the people who had got scared and left said, man, what's going on down in that valley? 
They said, man, I'm telling you what. These Israelites are defeating the Philistines. They said, well, boy, don't leave us out. Let's get in on it. We need Holy Ghost, God sent, earth shaking, heaven bound revival. But I'm going to tell you, it never happened without the Word of God. And for us to get on our faces in that book again and say, God, I'm willing to crawl. I'm willing to crawl through the difficult times. I'm willing to hurt and I'm willing to bleed. But God, I'm not, I'm not going to let the truth go. And when I get there, God, if i got to use it, I'm going to use it. I'm amazed how much we apologize. Steer around. I, I read books and listen to preachers, and I think, why do you want to get around the truth? If it's a truth, just preach it, teach it, live it. I am firmly persuaded, and I'm fixing to close, Brother Danny. Most people believe the Bible. The problem is, which Bible do they believe? You, you're going to tell me about your different versions and all that. I'll tell you straight up, I'm an old King James man. I never saw any reason to change, and I'm not changing for you or nobody else. If that offends you, I'm sorry, I love you, but I'm not changing. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the different versions or translations. Most people believe the Bible that they've wrote right here in their mind. I've dealt with people many times, and they'll say, well, this is what I believe. And I say, okay, where's that in the Bible? Well, I don't have any idea if that's what I believe. Man, I, I have strong conviction in my heart I'm right. Well, where's it at in the Bible? Well, I don't know. I'm not a preacher like you are. I have to work. Okay? Well, let me show you what the Bible says. Well, I know you can trick me up in the Bible. I'm not trying to trick you up. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. Well, I don't want to hear it. I know what I believe. You know what most people believe? They believe the Bible they've written themselves. And you know what we got to do if we ever going to have victory? we got to get it in our heads. You and I have no say-so. God is not a Democrat. Thank God. He's not a Republican. Thank God. He's not an Independent. God is a dictator. 3,800 times. Thus saith the Lord are the equivalents found in this Bible. It is God's Word. You and I have got to get to the point that we're going to believe it like Jonathan did. God bless you, Brother Danny. Thank you.